Hi and hello everyone, welcome back to period 7 of the APUSH curriculum. Today we've got Key Concept 7.2.1, Culture and Conflict in the 1920s. Now just a reminder, we're watching the videos for this period out of order of the concept outline. This should be the fifth video that you're watching in a row, so please pay attention to that. Now what we're going to be dealing with in this video has to do with this era that's very much um, sort of even beloved to this very day in the 1920s. It's called the Roaring Twenties, the Jazz Age. Um, a lot of people look at this, this era kind of like a decade-long party, but um, one of the facts about the 1920s is that for all that culture that's going on, there's also a lot of conflict, so it's kind of a, um, a mixed bag. There's kind of these two things going on. Um, that exists side by side, we often forget the second one and focus on the first. So we'll be looking at both today. Here we go. Or not here we go. Now here we go. There we are. Alright, so first thing we need to talk about is how um, basically mass communication and technology is really contributing to a different type of culture that's developing in the United States during the 1920s. And a major component about that was the radio. In red right there, it's really important. Now, we take this for granted anymore, the idea that people across our country and even the world today are hearing the same news, they're hearing, they're watching the same shows, listening to the same music. But communication was very difficult back before um, the radio existed. Once it starts to become prominent in use by um, average people in the 1920s, they're hearing the same things, they're hearing the same jokes, they're using the same slang. A lot of regional peculiarities start to disappear as a more homogeneous culture develops. All right, so some music that spread during this era, Glenn Miller, Duke Ellington. Um, so Duke Ellington was a major jazz musician and one of the most famous of the era. Other radio shows, so it wasn't just music on the radio, it was also uh, sort of the way we have TV shows, of course, um, there's not going to be any visuals when you're on the radio. So, a couple of them were Amos and Andy, which was um, actually, when you look back, kind of like a show about black stereotypes, so not too great. The Lone Ranger is one that's often remembered um, to this day because it later becomes a TV show as well. And actually, some soap operas get their beginnings on the radio uh, before they go to TV when um, TV becomes prominent in the 50s and the 60s. So there used to be the soap opera called Guiding Light that was on for years and years and years. It was so old that it started as a radio show and then just adapted to television when it came around. So everyone is listening to the same shows and the same music. And the big influence here is it led to a national language. So unified slang terms for different things. I don't know if anyone's seen this online, but there's this dialect test that you can um, take. And based on which words you choose for different things, it can kind of pinpoint which area your um, American English is most similar to um, in terms of your lexicon. Um, so I can show that to you in class if you feel like it. I can also show you what some of these slang words were um, and some of them that we even still use today. Okay, so let me show that to you in class so we can save some time here. Now, as radio is developing, so is the idea of people are watching and listening to the same forms of entertainment, and this is how we get kind of a celebrity culture. Because people are consuming the same media, they can talk about these things in their everyday lives. And it's not just radio, but it's also the developing movies and talkies. Now, I've talked about movies before, the idea of things like Birth of a Nation, kind of these, um, that was a long one, but lots of short movies with no sound because they didn't have the technology yet to sync up uh, the video with the audio. It's in the 1920s that they developed this technology, um, and it only increases the popularity of going to the, uh, the movies. Okay? Now that people are all watching the same movies, they're having the same interest in the same celebrities. So movie stars, dancers, models, people who are famous for no real reason or no real talent, all you have to do is turn on TV or go on social media today to um, <laughs> see examples of that. Uh, one of the first movies that's important to talk about here is in 1927. It was called The Jazz Singer. Now, it's important because it's the very first talkie. Now, today we just say movies for all moving pictures. Back then they distinguished for silent movies, were called movies, and then movies with talking, movies with audio, were called talkies. The term talkie disappears as silent movies actually um, disappear as well. All right, now, something to know about the jazz singer, so important in technological terms, but very representative of how this was a... Um, <laughs> an era of conflict because what was the topic of the movie? It was about an actor who put on blackface and that's how he got famous. 
Okay? So think about that. In the same way that Birth of a Nation, the movie that um, was one of the first sort of full-length feature films, was about how the KKK saved the South uh, from sort of black supremacy during during Reconstruction, we have the first talking movie about another sort of racial discrimination issue going on in the United States. So realize that people um, went to the movies more often before TV existed. When people went to the movies, there might be newsreels or um, basically other shorts to tell them about what's going on in the world, especially during wartime. Um, and this movie represents well what's going on. Okay? Now that Hollywood and celebrity culture are developing, something else that changes is um, depictions of women in the media. So now that women are much more visible on the national stage like this, uh, women involved in media um, sort of develop the image of the flapper that we associate with the 1920s. Now the flapper represented a liberated woman who was willing to be more provocative in how she dressed and how she acted, pushing the social norms and the limits of the era. Okay, so um, she would often cut her hair short in a hairstyle called a bob. Okay, so previously women had long hair. They often showed more skin, so ankles. Oh my god! Uh, no, but it was more than just ankles, but it was really just kind of a an identity of, not say, of saying, I'm not going to be this old, kind of reserved, traditional, um, values sort of woman that existed in the 19th century with the middle class but kind of using your middle class in order to um, be able to go out into the world and be um, have more of a public presence, more in the public sphere than just in the private sphere. Okay, so much more kind of sexual in nature as well, willing to sort of push those limits, but still not really going um, as far. There's kind of this, this point of view of people who actually interacted with flappers in the 1920s and said, yeah, it seemed like, you know, all women were trying to be flappers, but they weren't doing every single component. They might cut their hair short, but not really change their behavior. Or they might change their behavior, but not really dress the same way. So it's all these components create this image of the flapper, even though the flapper um, is sort of a construct rather than the way that all women were acting. So just keep that in mind. All right, so something else that's developing with culture in the 1920s arose from the migration that was happening. We've talked about the Great Migration before, where many African Americans move up into northern cities and western cities to get out of the south. Now, as uh, more African Americans are living in the cities, they developed in the same way that immigrants kind of developed these ethnic um, enclaves, enclaves. Uh, they developed kind of black neighborhoods within the cities, and within those there was the possibility for the development of a distinct sort of black culture, especially with art um, and music and all that. Uh, a good example of this is the Harlem Renaissance. Um, it's a movement specifically in one a neighborhood of New York City, and what happened is so many African Americans lived there um, that they kind of were separate from the rest of the city, which means that they could develop their own culture, their own art, um, live in their own neighborhood without worrying as much uh, about as much discrimination um, from white America at the time. A term that goes with this is called the New Negro. Now, by the way, Negro back then was the word used by whites and blacks to talk about black Americans. So it's antiquated today, but it's the appropriate word that they used back then. Um, and basically, the New Negro looked at things in this time period saying, yeah, there's Jim Crow, yeah, there's racism, yeah, there's discrimination, but we're in Harlem we can develop a new identity for ourselves that separates us from that, okay? Um, some sort of cultural icons related with the Harlem Renaissance, the poet Langston Hughes really expresses kind of the zeitgeist of the era, the point of view of what it was like to be black in America, but then also to be black and living in Harlem in this time period, and how those two identities um, are very different from each other. An author that we still read today is Zora Neale Hurston, uh, so she wrote a book called Their Eyes Were Watching God about this young black woman growing up in the South and trying to find her own identity as, um, as an African-American person, but also as a woman. So kind of these competing ideas and how can you find peace of mind when all your identities are trying to be subjugated by the rest of society. All right. The music of the time was jazz. It begins and evolves in the South, but as the Great Migration occurs, um, the music and culture comes with black Americans when they come up north. So eventually jazz is not just kind of the music of African American culture at the time, but it is the um, sort of the music of the 1920s. It goes mainstream in this time era 
time period. And we see most white Americans, especially kind of the youth, the flappers, kind of this vibrant 1920s culture, appropriates jazz, <coughs> goodness, as the music of their era as well. You even have some instances of the most famous jazz clubs like the Cotton Club um, in Harlem being closed to blacks because it was segregated. So all the best black musicians are there, all the wait staff are um, African American, but the people who can go there to enjoy things are only white. It's kind of a contradiction of this era and the Harlem Renaissance. Now something that the Harlem Renaissance represents is a bigger movement, not just kind of cultural fervor within the black community, but also the potential for black separatism and the success of that. Black separatism is the idea of being black in America means you're not going to be accepted by your white um, sort of, you know, citizens. So what seems to work? Separating yourselves in different neighborhoods. So the idea of almost like separate but equal, but creating equality for yourself because society won't give it to you. A big advocate of this within the time period was Marcus Garvey, and he took black separatism to a whole different level. So not just creating your own neighborhoods like Harlem, but going as far as to say we've got to go all back to Africa because there's no hope for us in America. But there's a lot of contradictions with this Marcus Garvey guy. His picture's on the right, right there in the middle. Now, he was from Jamaica. He'd never been to Africa, but was promoting that all people of African descent should return to Africa when most um, black Americans didn't want to. So it's kind of this weird movement where, like, it's got all these things going on that don't really actually make sense. The thing you need to realize is it does all tie in with black separatism, the idea of what are the possibilities for black Americans within this era of Jim Crow and the lowest possible point, the nadir of race relations in America. Now, eventually, he kind of gets um, some support within the black community, and the government starts to fear him, and what... Um, he's trying to do is trying to give kind of pride and a new identity for black Americans. It gets to the point that they corner him in New York and basically give him the option of either being thrown in prison or being deported. He chose to be deported instead, um, and the movement kind of dies out with that. All right, so one other artistic movement that's developing alongside the Harlem Renaissance is kind of this lost generation. So all these uh, famous novelists and artists um, that are sort of disillusioned after World War I. Many of them fought in World War I and saw the absolute devastation that the Great War brought upon. Um, a lot of them are really experiencing PTSD and they use art in order to get through it. So Ernest Hemingway, um, he was an ambulance driver over there. Fitzgerald, I think he tried to serve but never actually got sent over. Gertrude Stein was an American that moves to Paris and kind of develops this kind of salon where um, people can come with their artistic ideas and build upon each other. So many of these Americans expatriate themselves to Europe, so they choose to leave America and sort of um, almost escape in a way. They're escaping reality in order to enjoy the culture that especially exists in major um, European cities after the war. So if you're looking for an idea of what this is like, Hemingway um, wrote a great memoir called A Movable Feast, about his experiences. There's the um, more recent film, film Midnight in Paris that represents this. Um, and Fitzgerald, of course, wrote some fantastic novels that represent uh, what it was like to live in this time period as well. The thing I ask you to keep in mind, though, is they wrote some amazing pieces of literature and created great art. I mean, people like Picasso and Dali, all these people are involved in this movement as well. But essentially, their art is a way to cope with the fact of how World War I shattered people's view of society. Everything was suddenly disjointed and fractured, and you can see that in things like um, like Dada in art. You can see that in things like uh, Cubism and how Picasso's style changes with World War I because of the effect that it has on not just art, but the psyche behind the art. And I am way off topic, and this is the point where I say we really need art history at school. Anyway, next, um, what I do here? Sorry, my pointer's not working. There we go. So, we just looked at a lot about kind of the great culture that's developing in the U.S., but remember, I told you that this is an era of simultaneous culture and conflict. Now we're going to look at the conflict, kind of the seedy underbelly of the late um, sort of 19-teens and the 1920s. So we have to go back to World War I for a second and talk about how amidst that there was this development of restrictions on freedom of speech, civil liberties, um, and what that looked like going into the 1920s as well. 
Now, during World War I, something called the Creel Committee was created, um, and basically it was used as a way to spread propaganda to promote um, American values, American patriotism, but also turn Americans against Germany and our new enemies in the war. So the way this kind of worked is that um, sort of agents of the federal government would go around to cities and towns and give public speeches to, again, promote the war message, to get people worked up in patriotism so that they would support the war, but also make sure that they uh, made it clear who the enemy was as well and why we were fighting them. So kind of unifying public sentiment for the war and against anyone who was against the war. Now, that's just a sort of promotion tactic, right? PR. But what happened too is Congress and the president created some laws um, that are actually going to limit this even further. The two major ones are the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act, and they aim to limit people's civil liberties in the name of um, promoting the war effort and limiting dissent during wartime when we needed, as they said, national unity. So what did these do? What does these do? Um, the Espionage Act, I think there's one called the Alien Act as well. Um, foreigners could be deported without due process, so that means they didn't get their day in court before they would be kicked out of the country. It's exactly what happened to Marcus Garvey. And the Sedition Act said that if you were speaking out against the government or the war effort, um, you could be thrown in jail. And this happened to a major socialist named Eugene Debs, who was always running um, for president in the Socialist Party in America. Um, he finally got in prison. He was like in his 70s or his 80s. And even after the war, after these things, um, you know, shouldn't have been necessary anymore, Woodrow Wilson refused to let him out of jail, not because of, you know, you know, the war was over, it didn't matter, because he was a socialist. Now, these ideas go in line with the idea that are your civil liberties and rights actually rights, or are they privileges that can be taken away from you? I think the evidence speaks for itself that they're really more privileges when the government doesn't want to guarantee them to you. Now, ideas like the Espionage and Sedition Act really continued into the 1920s, and this is where we get our first Red Scare. We get a second Red Scare in the 1950s. This has to do with um, a fear of communism and socialism getting involved with people's political views and potentially in the government as well. Now, the thing that the government did is they basically um, enacted these raids on suspected communists or socialists. They're called the Palmer Red Raids because the Attorney General, kind of the president's um, appointee of running kind of the Department of Justice, uh, was the war one man kind of behind these that was spearheading going after radical organizations and people. So this is the same way, again, that um, that Marcus Garvey was deported. Other people like Emma Goldman, a very famous um, socialist from Russia, now living in America, was deported as well. Okay, Part of the Red Scare was just this fear of communism because of the success of the Russian Communist Revolution. And that fear says if more people are coming from Europe to our country, does that mean their ideas are coming too? And is that going to cause a revolution in our own country like there was in Russia, okay? All this was built with fear by the government, so both um, sort of trying to limit the spread of these ideas, but also punishing the belief in them. Now, a really good example of this is a specific court case about two Italian immigrants named Sacco and Vanzetti. So they were anarchists, so that means that they believed in kind of like the overthrow of the government in favor of not having a government. So they had um, radical political views. And um, there was a murder outside of Boston, and people said, oh, I think it was them. So these men were arrested with little to no evidence. The evidence that was there was very questionable in terms of forensics, and forensics uh, weren't great in this time period anyway. There were lots of unreliable witnesses who said, eh, it might have been him. So all this was used in a case that, in a, from a modern point, wouldn't have resulted in, um, in what's the word, in... I can't think of the word, in not acquittal, so in indictment, there we go. Um, but what happened because of this era of dislike and fear of anyone who had radical political views, dislike and sort of persecution against immigrants and foreigners, it means that they got an unfair trial and they got executed for a crime that they might not have committed. Um, lots of historians and legal experts have re-examined the case year after year, and all we know is it's unclear. They might have done it, but the evidence used in the case at the time, um, from a modern standpoint, again, could not have resulted um, in a guilty, um, guilty verdict if we look at it now.
interesting, right? Essentially, that trial instead focused on their points of view and the danger of that and building fear within the jury and not the actual crime, okay? So it represents the Red Scare well and how it really did have um, um, sort of terminal effects on people who were accused of these things without real evidence. All right, our last slide, it's kind of a mix of the two. It's talking about how there was all this culture, but there was conflict and controversy as well. So um, let's see how these things, these ideas of kind of modern views and traditional views kind of like collided in this cultural um, sort of, you know, conflict within the 1920s. Now, one of the major components of this uh, had to do with the Prohibition Amendment. So this is the culmination of the temperance movement that we've studied many times before, developing all the way in like the 1820s. Now, it's in the 1920s when it's actually put into effect. Um, bum, bum, bum. But here's the thing you have to know, is that there were a lot of groups who had power and control that wanted it enacted to control other people, but once it was in place, no one really wanted to follow the law. It was regularly broken by most Americans. They thought, yeah, yeah, we want to limit the consumption, but I'm still going to get to drink beer and wine, right? Well, it ended up that the amendment and the law that enforced it were a lot stricter than people thought. So what happened as a result is people say, well, we don't take this rule seriously. We don't, we don't want to take this law seriously. The federal government nor the state's government wanted to pay money to enforce it. So there was rampant and just flouting of this law um, and lots of people sort of engaged in, you know, small time and large time crime in order to get a drink. So some terms that go along with this, um, these illegal bars that existed were called speakeasies, usually because there was a password or a secret knock in order to get in. Um, bootleggers were people that uh, smuggled alcohol and made it themselves. They were called bootleggers because they would often hide um, the sort of glass containers of alcohol in their boots as they walked around the city trying to transport it. Because here was the thing about um, prohibition. It did not make drinking alcohol illegal, but it did make the production, the sale, the buying, the transportation, et cetera, et cetera, of alcohol illegal. So basically, you could drink it, but only if it had if you had it in your house already and it was there before 1919. So there's some people that had so much alcohol that they were able to drink all through the 1920s dis despite it being illegal. Okay. Now, one of the biggest effects of prohibition is the creation of organized crime. Okay. What happened is these different crime groups realized people still want to drink. There needs to be a distribution network. So we'll create this where we provide neighborhoods um, alcohol that we create illegally, they buy it illegally, um, and everyone kind of helps each other out in the process to create this black market of alcohol. Now, what happens, though, is once uh, the Prohibition Amendment is sort of overturned in uh, 1933 by the 21st Amendment, we actually see that the organized crime structure still exists, but they can't distribute alcohol anymore, so they start distributing drugs instead. Okay, so... Prohibition aimed to limit um, sort of sin and vice in society, and it also actually created more, um, so kind of an unintended consequence. A little heuristic to remember which amendments are involved in prohibition. The 18th enacted it, the 21st repealed it. Um, you become of age in America at 18, but you can't drink until you're 21. Okay, so the, the numbers line up, it's a good way to remember it. Now, uh, so... The points of view on consuming alcohol had a lot to do with culture conflict. Traditional values wanted the temperance movement. Modern city values wanted um, it gone. They wanted to be able to consume alcohol and exist in this kind of 1920s culture that we think of. Uh, so that's one um, demonstration of this cultural conflict. Another great kind of microcosm of this is something called the Scopes Monkey Trial. So what this was is it was a small time case in Tennessee about a local law that was broken by a teacher, but it caught the attention of the entire nation because it showed this cultural conflict. In fact, it caught the attention of the world, I should say. So it was over the teaching of evolution in schools. Now what happened is this um, teacher, John Scopes, um, he purposely broke a Tennessee law that said that only creationism could be taught about where everyone came from in science class. Uh, the reason he broke it was not because he was some sort of you know, progressive, you know, firebrand. It was because he was a substitute PE teacher being made to teach science. So he didn't really know what to do. He's like, well, I'll use the textbook. And the Tennessee science textbook 
um, had evolution and not creationism in there, but the state made a law that they couldn't teach evolution, they could only teach creationism. So his point was not to sort of create this cultural battle, but just to reveal kind of the inconsistencies of the state law versus the state-provided textbooks. What he gets is something completely different. So the nation is sort of fixated on this. People come into this small um, town, I think it was Dalton, ten Dayton, Tennessee, and they're bringing monkeys and they're all these fundamental um, Christian sort of evangelicals, you know, holding all these signs and there's just conflict in the streets. The courtroom is packed um, and it shows this battle between modern and traditional values. The lawyers there were two of the most famous lawyers in the country. Clarence Darrow was a very famous lawyer from Chicago that had been in a lot of celebrity cases. Um, and the, the um, side that was defending the state was William Jennings Bryan, our perennial loser of the presidential elections, former populist, and a Christian fundamentalist. He basically stepped up in order to do it because he believed in the law that Tennessee was trying to enforce. So, two best lawyers in the country dealing with kind of an insignificant case in the middle of Tennessee. Now, what ends up happening is Scopes loses the case. There was no doubt that he was guilty, by the way, okay? Um, he taught evolution. It was illegal. It should have been like a slam dunk thing and moved forward. But because there was so much attention, the case gets a lot of um, attention from us even today. Now, what happened is Darrow, the lawyer for Scopes, even knew that Scopes was guilty, but he said, how can I use this case to reveal the inconsistencies of um, religious fundamentalism. So it got to the point where he wanted to call an expert on Christianity up to the, um, up to the, I can't think of the right word, um, basically to give testimony about it. And William Jennings Bryant volunteers. So the lawyer um, for the prosecution is being interrogated pretty much by the lawyer for the defense. It's something that never really happens. Um, and what happens is Darrow has Brian up there. He kind of grills him in all these kind of minutia from the Old Testament, asking like, so how is it that the sun stopped in the sky for a day? So you said we should interpret the Bible literally. How could that happen? He was trying to just basically get Brian in a corner to finally say that, well, not everything in the Bible should be taken literally. And he finally got him to say that, proved his point, but lost the case. Now, William Jennings Bryant at this point was in his 80s, and he actually died within just a couple weeks after this case happened, but he was a happy man at the end of his life, even though um, he lost a lot along the way. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about is another cultural conflict that shows just how um, controversial these views on society were in the 1920s, and that is a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan. And the way I like to say this is they go mainstream. The KKK of the 1870s and 80s was really more a Southern organization looking to sort of limit the success of Reconstruction efforts. Once Jim Crow goes into effect, they get their way, so they kind of diminish, okay? They don't have as much of a public presence because there is a legal political structure that limits um, um, African American rights, and they no longer had to terrorize them to get it done. The government was doing it for them. But what happens in the 1920s is there are new people coming to America. There are new ideas like evolution. There are all these things, social norms, that challenge the traditional structure. And the KKK reemerges as a force of hate, and, it's, and I like to say expands that scope of hatred. So it's not just African Americans anymore. It's Jews, it's Catholics, it's immigrants, foreigners, communists, socialists, anarchists. Basically, anyone who wasn't a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant born in America they, um, they didn't like them, okay? And there is sort of widespread um, condoning of these views such to the point that membership in the Klan gets to four million in America. They have a march on Washington, D.C. with one of the scariest images you'll ever see of thousands of, of these Klan members in robes walking down Constitution Avenue with the Capitol looming in the background. And they had their permit. They were allowed to do this. They have freedom of assembly. But this image of our governmental hallowed institutions next to a force of hatred um, really shows this, um, these contradicting factors within the 1920s. Now, um, the KKK was so widespread that there were many places where if you weren't a Klan member, you couldn't get elected, especially in the South. In the South, the KKK was synonymous with the Democratic Party, but there's membership spreading in the KKK, even on the West Coast, even in the North. It is not just a Southern phenomenon anymore. 
Okay, and this continues in the 1920s because cultural conflict continues as well. All right, thank you so much for watching this one. Hope you thought it was fun. Every, most students tend to love the 1920s, so I hope you liked it too. You've got some note cards to make, so red or yellow terms only. Remember when choosing those, try to make sure they're relevant to this time period and not former ones. So don't choose something like the temperance movement just because it was in red. Choose the term prohibition instead. You've got a quiz to do, do it at 8 a.m., geography to work on, chronology to study, and more videos to watch if you're ready to go. So thank you so much for watching. This is Mr. Chidola signing off, and I will see you in class. Bye.